Well, good evening and welcome everyone to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960 AM. Um, the last couple of weeks obviously have been, um, you know, completely uh, focused on uh, Black Lives Matter, on the protests in the United States, um, and, uh, and also COVID-19. Uh, I've had a couple of panels on uh, this topic and it's really been quite interesting. Uh, and I reached out to, uh, actually someone told me I should reach out to, and I reached out to Vivine Salmon, who is president of the uh, Canadian Bar Association. And I thought it would be interesting to get her perspective. Vivine, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So you've got obviously a very senior position um, in the Canadian Bar Association. Um, what does this whole Black Lives Matter and uh, protests in the United States mean to you? Oh, that's such a big question. Um, well, you know, racism is something that's not new. Um, it's something that has been in our society for a long time. But I think this movement is a new generation, I think, taking up the gauntlet um, for racial equality. And I think it's great to see um, that level of energy, that it's a worldwide movement and that, um, you know, it's bringing together communities, I think, rather than dividing communities. And I think just really highlighting how important the issue is and the struggle that people have gone through and hoping, I think, for a, a better outcome and more equality for all down the road. Now, as you say, you know, there's been racism for a long period of time and there's been a lot of people objecting to racism for a long period of time. What was it that triggered things so significantly this time? Huh. Well, I, well, I think it's obviously the death um, that was quite traumatic that we've seen in the United States. Um, I think that shocked everyone in the world um, because I think it's so visceral, right? In front of your eyes, you're seeing somebody pass away, somebody who has become so vulnerable um, because you're incapacitated. Um, so I think, I think that touched a lot of people just seeing that level of vulnerability and that all of us could potentially be in such a vulnerable state with our life ended with, with a, you know, in so quickly and so sadly and so traumatically. So I think that really touched people. I think it was something about the knee on the neck that it was so long that he, yeah. was saying he couldn't breathe and that he even called out for his mother. It made it far more personal and real for a lot of people than, you know, the week later when someone was shot. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, you know, obviously both are traumatic, but, uh, but to actually see that knee on the neck for such a long period of time, how can you not look at that and be disgusted? Well, I, I found it really difficult to look at quite honestly. I did. I, couldn't see the whole thing. To be frank with you, I saw snippets and I found it very traumatic seeing that because when I think about this, and not just racism, but in general, when these traumatic events happen to people, um, and even recently, um, you know, a car accident where a, a whole family was wiped away, you can't be helped be moved by that. It, it's it's the fragility of life. It's knowing that it could be you or your friend. And it's knowing that somebody gave life to this person, right? And, and they went through potentially hours of label, labor to give life to another human being, right? And that, that's a, its essence, I think, that we're all human beings. We all feel pain. We all go through all the gauntlets of human emotion. Um, and that's where I, I think it really touches the heart, but I hope not just touching the heart. I hope that out of this trauma, especially trauma for the family and obviously trauma for the person who died, um, that we can inner reflect as a society to build a better world, quite frankly. But then, you know, to have, and there's been lots of, regrettably, lots of people that have been uh, um, subject to similar kinds of assault um, over the years, to have that turn into, you know, a North American, if not a global protest movement with thousands of people in the middle of a pandemic where we're supposed to be, you know, social distancing, coming out and uh, protesting in the streets was... It was unbelievable. And, you know, I almost, and this is not a fair analogy, but let me use it if I could for a second. You know, there's been uh, issues about, uh, um, you know, assaults on females for a long period of time. And then all of a sudden this Me Too movement 
got legs um, and took off a couple years ago. And it was almost as if uh, something about uh, this Minneapolis situation and probably that, uh, you know, it was it during this COVID-19 pandemic, um, tensions just flamed. Well, I mean, I, I think everyone is under stress on top of it, right? Um, going through COVID-19 is also trauma. And recently I was reading in the paper, um, I think his name is Stephen Bang, Elizabeth Hurley's um, um, my former partner had um, committed suicide in Los Angeles by jumping, I think it was 27 um, feet off his condo building, right? And all these events are really traumatic and troubling and horrible for the people that go through it. But I think it just shows you that people um, are, and I don't know the specifics of his circumstance, obviously, but I think people are under a lot of stress and everybody reacts differently, being quarantined, being at home, um, you know, having relationships potentially disrupted, spending a lot of time alone or in isolation, not being able to social socialize as normal. I think all of these events are traumatic. And I think um, having unfortunate events in terms of what happened with um, George Floyd, I think it because we're on um, pandemic, it causes people to look inward. And it gives people, I think, more time to look inward and reflect than they might have had if this had happened in another point of time. So um, from that end, I think a lot of people are looking inward, reflecting perha perhaps on their own life, um, their own lifestyle, things that could be different, um, things that maybe we need to fix as a society. But I think when I think about it, I think perhaps that, that was a catalyst for having time now to look inward and to spend more time, um, you know, watching television or reading books or on the radio or other things and talking about um, political events of the day. We're chatting tonight with uh, Vivine Solomon, uh, president of the Canadian Bar Association about uh, racial relations. We're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Vivine Solomon. Salmon, I apologize, who is uh, president of the Canadian Bar Association. Uh, so Vivine, let me ask you a question. Um, I don't know the situation in Canada uh, from a justice standpoint. Uh, I'm sorry, and I'm interested in your opinion. But, uh, you know, there's been numerous different uh, stories in the United States on the media about how um, African Americans are not fairly treated in the in the legal system in the United States. Uh, Van Jones, a commentator on CNN, did a whole show that uh, you know went through how prosecutors would load up uh, charges and things like that, and uh, and that if uh, if you compared a white person and a black person with a similar kind of situation, the black person would uh, undoubtedly get charged, uh, would uh, be dealt with unfairly by the prosecution, would serve court time, and and potentially the white person would not. What's your opinion as to how, well, let me ask you a question. Is our, do we have systematic racism within the legal system in Canada? So like a lot of institutions, um, there's challenges in our system in terms of access to justice, in terms of how um, people are treated who are racialized in terms of gender. Um, there are definitely challenges. Um, that our system has struggled with for a long time. And we've seen that, um, quite frankly, in the incarceration rates um, that we have. Um, for example, the, pro the proportion of Indigenous people in federal custody has quite frankly been at a record high um, for many years. Um, we know that in terms of Indigenous women, they account for about 42% 40 of the female prison population. We know that um, in terms Sorry, hold of... Hold on. Apologize. What was that statistic? Indigenous um, people are 40... Indigenous women account for about 42% of the female prison population and black um, people um, make about 3.5% of the Canadian population and they're about double that in terms of um, the percentage of federal offenders. But, but female indig the indigenous females as a percentage of all females has got to be even less than you 3%. Well, we're, we're, we're when we look at the women in the population, whether that's white women, black women, you know, that's however. That is 42% yeah. of the prison population. 
Yeah, and 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 and, and frankly, I don't think a lot of people might realize, but it, it, it is it's shocking, right? And um and and not only is it shocking, I think it's tragic because at the end of the day, right? We all grow up as children with dreams and things that we want to achieve, and we look up to people that we want to become, and you know it hurts the heart quite frankly i live in downtown toronto um and the and just yesterday i was walking um after dinner and i saw two paramedics um with a gentleman who was incarcerated um in front of saint michael's hospital and quite frankly i don't want to get emotional now but quite frankly my heart quite bled because again i thought this is somebody's kid um this is a member of our community do people make mistakes yes do people make very horrible mistakes that um, as a society we have deemed the worst mistakes people can make, absolutely. But at the end of the day, there is, for the vast majority of people, I think most people grow up as children with hopes, with dreams, who want to be part of a loving family. And I think those things are, um, you know, quite difficult when at the other end we see a whole loss in a generation, a whole loss of talent um, who are um, in prisons, who could be so, productive members of our society. So what, what, what is the cause? It, is it, uh, you know, if 42% if of the female population in prisons is, is uh, Indigenous and you've got a, uh, you know, twice the per capita share of, uh, of uh, Black people in jail than in the regular population, what is it? Is it lack of employment? Is it uh, lack of uh, social structures? Is it uh, police that are prone to, uh, to uh, you know, racially profile? Uh, tell me what the, the causes are of this problem. Well, I think, I think like many problems, the, the causes are very complex. And I think they have been in development for a very long time. And I think that's why I think it's important as individuals, but as a society, we examine um, all our institutions that we know our history, that we know gener the impact of generational trauma. Um, this is not to say that people are not accountable for their individual actions and choices. That's my personal opinion. People are accountable for individual choices and actions. But at the same time, we have to understand um, a long history that has not set, been set up in terms of society to benefit, frankly, people like me and others. And that is not to say people are victims to their circumstance. I think it's to understand that there are societal structures outside of all of us that are created that we have to look at um, very logically in terms of how they were created, who they were created for, and how do we dismantle systems that only work for if, uh, um, a fragment of our population and work against those others. Um, so I, I think, like I said, I think the problems are very complex. I think even, um, I think in terms of our history and our education, I don't think um, even in the Canadian system that people realize that, you know what, there was slavery in Canada. Um, for me, frankly, I felt the first time that I truly had an inkling of the Indigenous um, child, um, generational trauma that had happened, whether it was res residential schools or other, is quite frankly in law school when I when I did um, advanced studies in Indigenous law. So I think, you know, the vast majority of the population do not privileged to have that level of education unless you read about it. And I think it is everybody's responsibility to read about it and become educated about how our society is shaped, whose history gets told, um, and how we together can ensure that we um, make a level playing field and we dismantle barriers that um, exist that don't benefit all of us equally. What do you mean by generational trauma? So I don't want to speak for Indigenous people because I'm not Indigenous, but in terms of the residential schools, um, many, many Indigenous people were um, forcibly removed from their family and you could, you, you could, it's not your lived experience, but anybody can put themselves in that, those shoes, whether you're a child or whether you're a parent, to have your child forcibly taking, taken from you, children that, that were as young as five years old or if not younger, 
um, to be abused by um, people that were supposed to be your protectors that um, in, in whether it was um, through the state or the church. Um, it's trauma and it's hard when a family is broken that way. It's hard to rebuild when your language is stripped away from you, when the bonds that should join families together um, in terms of support are disrupted. So that's what I'm talking about, whether it's in the indigenous community, the black community or other racialized communities, that trauma um, unfortunately for many people, not all people, but can manifest itself from generation to generation. And right. it's the same thing on the other side, if your family, if you come from a very loving family and you don't have that trauma, it's not that you can't create your own trauma, but I think it's easier for you to replicate the structures that you had yourself and that you grew up with. So I appreciate that. Let's get back to the legal system. You're president of the Canadian Bar Association. Is the legal system in Canada fair to, uh, to African Canadians, to Blacks? So I don't know the word fair. I don't know, quite frankly, that I find that hard to use the word fair because I don't really know what that means. But in terms of is the system um, broken to some degree. I think many lawyers would argue that we need, we have a lot of work to do in terms of, in terms of our justice system. So I, I think in any system, no system is perfect. I think there's a lot of people that work very hard within systems. And, and, and what I'm also saying is even though you yourself individually in the system are a good person and work very hard in the system, any system is bigger than one individual. And that's when we talk about systemic racism. It's not an individual police officer, for example, but it's in the whole system as a whole. How does it function? And does it function well for our communities? And how can we improve the system so that it functions well for all communities and we're not um, over policing, but we're giving everybody an opportunity? And um, so I think in terms of the justice system, I think that Canada's justice system is a very good one, but at the same time, it is not a perfect one. And there's improvements like in any, any system that has been, has such a long legacy, there's things that we can probably do better. And, and I'm not an expert on this area of law, but I'm happy to also recommend other guests who are um, experts in these areas of law, whether it's criminal or family, um, that are very important for us to understand how these work for the average Canadian. But I do know that problems tend to become snowball problems for people, not just racialized people, but anybody in the justice system. It's very important that our justice system form and access to justice system functions properly. The statistics I think is for about every um, dollar that we spend on, on the justice system, we actually save $6 in other aspects because when somebody gets in the justice system, then they have a small problem, they might not get a lawyer, then it becomes a bigger problem, then a bigger problem, then they might have financial problems, then they might have health problems. So for all of us in the society, it makes sense that we invest um, in education, we invest all these things up front, and we also invest what our justice system needs to ensure access to justice for everyone. So there's been a bunch of calls recently to defund police. Do you agree with that? Well, like I said, I'm not an expert in, um, in criminal law. Um, I would probably leave that specific question to the experts in terms of um, whether the police service should be defunded or not. But what I do know is that it's important for us to invest in children. It's important to us to invest in children early on. And I think that is also an individual responsibility, whether it's in your own family that you invest in your kids in terms of your time, in terms of your money. But I also think in the broader society, whether you go to synagogue or church or wherever you go, I think it, I think it was Hillary Clinton that said, it takes a village to raise a child. And that I don't think is a cliche. It's individual responsibility that we all work together to um, build a, a better society. And I don't have kids myself. I have five nieces and nephews who I love dearly. 
but anybody can see that you need to invest your time and energy in children um, to ensure that down the road we we have a, a well-functioning society that we all enjoy living in. Right. Um, so when you take a look at what's happening in the United States and all these protests that have even spilled over the border, is this a flash in the pan or do you think that's going to actually lead to some change? No, I don't, I don't think it's a flash in, in the pants. And I think that's a good thing. I think um, whether it's corporate Canada or other um, systems, I think are looking inwards. And I think it's particularly important that we don't think about these issues as a flash in the pants or they're, they're an issue of the day and then it dies down and something else flashes up. Really, fundamentally, as I said before, we're, we're trying to build a better society. And I think within corporate Canada as well, I think there has been measures over the years. I think we have had um, diversity and inclusion officers. We've talked about diversity. We've talked about inclusion. But at the end of it, it's not just having an officer there. It's fundamental change. It's not ticking a box. Hey, um, we have a piece of legislation. It's, it's really comes down, I think, and I don't want to sound maybe too hokey, but it really comes down to hearts and minds. That's what it really comes down to. And I think you can have as much legislation, you can have as much diversity officers as you want, but if the society doesn't itself fundamentally want to improve and want to change, I think it's difficult. So I think with this movement, I think it's across the world. I think people that haven't had to maybe think about this, these issues before, have had a chance to pause and maybe reflect um, and maybe think about ways that they live their life or ways that others live their life. And um, to think about everybody as a community that's integrated and not just them and other, but that we're all part of a community. And if I think if you don't think about community and your neighbor, I think it's hard to build the society when you're building walls around, and I mean emotional walls as well as societal walls. We're chatting with Vivine uh, Salmon tonight, president of the Canadian Bar Association. We're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour. We're chatting tonight with Vivine Salmon, who is the uh, Salmon, who is the president of the Canadian Bar Association, about race relations and what's been going on in the United States. Uh, Vivine, you're obviously very successful yourself. Why were you able to break through all those barriers when other people uh, aren't? Hmm, that's a difficult question and one that I've thought about too. And I, and I, and, and, you know, I don't know if I have the perfect answer, but what I do know is that I grew up in a very, very loving family. Um, my dad um, was part of the Wind Rush generation. So he immigrated from the Caribbean to England as part of the Wind Rush. And my uncle and his other brother were there and they had all immigrated as my dad is a trained carpenter. Um, and so from there, he'd actually read an article, a little ad in the newspaper in England who wanted skilled workers. And he um, essentially put his name forward and he was supposed to go to Vancouver. And I don't remember what happened, but something happened where he didn't go. And then they said, do you want to go to Kitchener or Montreal? And he was like, well, I'll try Kitchener. Um, so that's where I, I ended up growing up. And so my dad has lived there for over 50 years. And then he had went back to the Caribbean, met my mom at a barbecue. Um, and then they, he, my mom immigrated here to Canada to marry my dad. And so I have two older brothers. And my parents, um, it's a very uh, working class, blue collar um, folks. Um, my dad, like I said, was a trained carpenter. Um, and my mom was a PSW, um, um, very, very loving parents. My dad was, I would say, the strict one. My mom was the one with the soft, tender heart. So I think, think it's kind of good to have a combination. But, but, you know, I saw my parents' resilience and their toughness and their perseverance and, you know, just dedication to their family. And I think I... I think I would say I'm a family oriented person, even though I don't have my own children. And I think our family is very close knit. And I think that can help you go a long way, knowing that there's people behind you supporting your small victories. And when things go south, there's also people behind you supporting you when things go the other way. 
Yeah, no question. Uh, president Obama, former president uh, Barack Obama, a couple of years ago, did a speech on race relations. And he said, um, you know, frankly, to the African-American community, one of the challenges is that uh, there's a lot of fatherless families um, and that the, the fathers uh, got um, sort of pride of uh, going and, uh, and, and fathering lots of different children with several different mothers. And he said, that's a problem. We need to have uh, families with fathers. And I had a panel on uh, a week ago with uh, some people from the, uh, the black community in Canada. And they said the challenge is we're glorifying too often uh, gang uh, membership. Uh, do you think either of those are issues? Well, like I said, I don't know about glorying, gl glorifying gang membership. I don't, I don't think, um, to me, that seems like an odd statement. Um, I think there is trauma, like I talked about earlier, in many communities. And, you know, I think, again, like when I think about it, I think, frankly, people don't know their history and they don't know why um, that has been a legacy that has come to pass in terms of, again, generational trauma. And many, many people were stripped of their fathers um, during slavery. And that is part of the legacy of slavery that is hard to overcome. Um, but many people do overcome it. Many people do grow up in a loving family. And I also think that, um, you know, just because somebody's parents are divorced or not together doesn't mean that they don't have loving relationships. That doesn't mean that they don't have a community. I know we just celebrated Father's Day. And I think it's important to celebrate all types of families and knowing that kids can be raised in strong, loving families. I don't think it's a one size fits all model. Like I said, for me, I was privileged that I grew up in, I would say, a very strict um, conservative family. Um, I'd say de definitely my dad was on, the, I'd say, the more conservative side of things. Um, but, I, but I think every family is different. And I don't know, you know, um, in terms of... It sounds of, like your family dynamics were very important in your upbringing and your success in life. I don't, yeah, I would say for me, it was important. I can only speak for myself. Um, I think for my parents, education was very important. I think they felt that they had made a lot of sacrifices to immigrate to Canada. Um, for my dad, I think my dad had a lot, has, has and had a lot of loyalty to Canada as a newcomer. I think for my mom, you know, it was a little bit different because she had come to marry my dad. But I think in a lot of ways, my dad actively chose, like he chose to leave um, the Caribbean to go to England as part of that wind rush. He then chose to come to Canada. I think my dad felt he had a very, um, he had a very good life here. I think he felt very strongly that he was able to raise um, three happy children. My other brother is a teacher in, um, in Waterloo Region and my other brother um, works in marketing. Um, so I think from my dad's perspective, um, things went the way he, not all the way he wanted, but I think at the end, you know, living over 50 years in Canada now, I feel my, my dad feels in a lot of ways Canada made him. Um, and I feel proud to be part of that second generation where I feel that um, I understand the culture my parents um, came in, but I also feel very much a Canadian. And I think that's why I feel um, it's so intrinsic that as a second generation Canadian and third generation and fourth generation to come, that we do not face barriers that our parents faced in terms of our progression. And even for black female lawyers, um, we are at the, quite frankly, at the bottom of the pay scale. And a lot of us are, have a much higher education, whether it's masters in law, speaking multiple languages, in terms of racialized people in general, in terms of, um, there's an in-house corporate counsel study that we did recently. And um, racialized people make twelve to $12,000 or less compared to white men. And and there's a quite frankly a, a big difference and in terms of the average canadian the average canadian probably makes about fifty thousand dollars and the average black canadian in terms of that skill probably about thirty five thousand so yes people in the black community have had success yes people like me who are second generation have had success but there's still barriers and in terms of my personal experience i would have to say in every single job that i've had I think I have faced racism, whether it was overt or subvert. That's every my single, view. Every single job you've had. 
in my view, yes. Really? Yes. What about growing up in Kitchener? I don't think of Kitchener, frankly, as, uh, as a community that has a lot of color. It's a lot different now than when I grew up there. Um, but, but like, uh, and so when I grew up, it was fairly, a fairly homogenous community. Um, it's changed, I think, over time as Toronto as well has spread outwards. Um, but that's not to say that I didn't have a happy childhood, but then th like any childhood, there was moments um, and as I grew up and even now that is not all perfect and sunshine and roses. And as a black woman, I think there's experiences I have that are unique to me as a black woman. Um, and, and like I said, in, in probably every job I've had and in every role, I think I've had to experience racism in, in some degree. Now, has that held me back? No, but that also means that there's also additional barriers that you've had to fight to get where you are. Right. So how do we get rid of this? So I feel, again, I feel it's everybody taking responsibility. I don't, I don't feel that it should be put on the black community and said, okay, this affects you, fix everything. We're operating a system that frankly, we didn't create. I think, like I said earlier, when I spoke, I think it takes a community and a village to take individual responsibility and then um, responsibility as a society. How can you as an individual be a better person? How can you as an individual be a better friend? How can you be an ally? How can you stand up in your workplace? If you see something right, not right, or even small things, like if, if you have a work party and you know somebody deliberately excluded somebody else, do you have the courage to stand up? And I'll give you an example of that. One of my earliest childhood memories was when I was five years old in Kitchener, which was, like I said, pretty white. And all the other little girls, we used to walk home together. And I remember this one other girl had recently moved there. And we were all walking home and she told all the other girls that she, no one should walk home with me anymore because I was black and I was not attractive and my hair was like straw. So that's a childhood memory that I, I frankly find it, it's, it was tra tra traumatizing and it's hard to forget. But I had a, a best friend at the time, a childhood best friend that was Sally. And I remember her telling this other little girl um, that she didn't understand why I couldn't walk home with them when we all walked home long before this other girl had joined the pack. Right. So what I'm saying is in that small childhood personal story that I, I don't tell a lot of people is one, I think there's good people everywhere, but do good people make mistakes? Yes. And I think it's incumbent in all of us, like I said, to take responsibility of your own world first, right? Whether it's work, church, synagogue, um, wherever you worship or wherever you go to school or if you don't worship, doesn't matter where you are. Um, take responsibility of your community. Take responsibility of your workplace. If you see something not, excuse me, right at your workplace, do you have courage to bring it forward? And I think uh, one of the, the top things I think is for people that have been given very, a lot of privilege in life, whether that's with money, whether that's in your um, company, wherever it is, I think you have a responsibility as from tone from the top to do what you can to improve things, right? It's not enough to, I think, um, think that your lot in life is to just make money. I think we all have a bigger responsibility to each other to improve things. You know, I think you're right. And I think that uh, it's really come to pass uh, to a lot of people during this last uh, couple of weeks when uh, you know, a lot of the protests, uh, there's been a lot of uh, white people and, uh, and, and non-black, uh, you know, other colored people out uh, supporting. And I think that there's a lot of people that have seen this as, uh, as so critically important and a game changer for race relations that they've decided to go out and, and participate in the protests. And I think that's wonderful. And the fact that it wasn't just a, uh, an African-American crowd, it was a, a mixed crowd. Um, and often in some places, a very white crowd, I think was, uh, was a very positive move. I think, I think it's absolutely positive. And, I, and I, that's what I think it takes. Um, you know, a little bit of introspection, um, a little bit of, I guess, self-awareness for all of us, right? To have, um, I think, personal sensitivity to understand that we all have different life experiences. 
some people have tougher life experiences than others. And although you can't perhaps walk in my shoes as a black woman, and I can't walk in your shoes as a white man, that we can um, be sensitive to each other and think about ways that we can be supportive in a society and ways that we can um, help each other and ways that you can um, build somebody up, whether it's um, be becoming a mentor or offering that because we know in our legal communities, um, there's not always the same level of mentorship um, in the legal community that some white male lawyers experience, which helps them in their career all along. And then they wind up the managing partner, right, of a firm. So, um, so I think we're, no one I think is looking for a hand out. I think everybody is looking for um, a hand up. And I think that's where I think it takes the community and the village to, and the sensitivity and introspection to look inward, all of us, but to know that there are systemic barriers that we can dismantle and we can actively dismantle them to make it a better society and a, and a fair playing field. Sounds like a great strategy for me. And you seem to be the, uh, the perfect um, mentor, the perfect inspirational person to look at. You're articulate, you're intelligent, uh, you're passionate about what you believe in. So thank you very much for joining us tonight on the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, hopefully chatting with you again on some other issues in the future. And uh, I think that you uh, will inspire a lot of, uh, of young ladies, whether they're, uh, they're black or not black, to, uh, to pursue a lot because uh, you're very impressive. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you.